I am, I am excited to be here. As John said, my wife and I have been running BASIC. Uh, we are actually wrapping up our 12th year doing BASIC. And um, God is doing some amazing things. And if anyone wants to talk to us afterwards, we'd love to just encourage you in what God is doing on the college campus. But before I, I speak, I want to just take a second and I want to recognize uh, the leadership of this church. Um, Pastor Jonathan, you've been a phenomenal friend, a leader. Pastor Ron and Judy, what, the things you guys have done, the foundation you've laid for us to grow and build is phenomenal. And so thank you guys. Give it up for our leaders, our pastors. Uh, John has been uh, a great friend. He's been able to, to model leadership, even being a husband and a father himself. We're setting the bar high here. And so thank you guys. Well, I want to start, um, as I grew up, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't uh, really get involved until later in high school. But I was a people pleaser. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. I was constantly compromising my convictions, spreading myself thin to make other people happy. Right? Constantly just, what can I do to be a doormat so someone else likes me? So someone else is comfortable in their life. And so I would navigate life with addictions to pornography, with getting drunk, with doing different things, while still being on high honor roll, while still doing good in sports and having friends. And so on the outside, everything looked great. But on the inside, everything was falling apart. And maybe some of you can relate with that. And so when I became a Christian, that didn't magically go away. Right? I started um, having those same ideas of what is on the outside is what matters. And as John said, I became a Christian my freshman year of college. It was actually October 2nd, 2006. Pastor Ron came on campus and he spoke. And for whatever reason, my hand went up and I said, I'll follow Jesus. I, I kind of was surprised it was there, and um, continued this journey of following Jesus. And I was so excited of what it meant, and I, and I would share with my roommates and friends and classmates about Jesus and about following him, and I would invite them to basic. But you see, some of my friends would come, some would leave. Some actually came and got saved, their lives transformed. But if I'm being honest, I would only invite my friends on my way to basic, right? I would put my Christian hat on and I'm on my way to basic and I'd say, hey, come follow Jesus with me. It's, he's so amazing. But then Monday night would end and I would go to my engineering classes because I'm an engineer. So I'd put on my engineer hat and I'd engage with my engineering classmates like any other engineer. I'd have the same conversations. I didn't do anything differently. And then class would get out and I would go to rugby practice. And thank God rugby wasn't on Sundays or Monday nights. I didn't have an excuse. I would go to church. I would come to basic. But around the rugby players, I'd put my rugby hat on and I would talk like a rugby player and I would act like a rugby player and I would drink with the rugby players and I would do all of these things quite well. And I didn't see anything wrong with it. Because from the outside, each group of people I was with, I was doing very well. I was fitting in so well, and so then again, on a Sunday, I'd come to church. On a Monday, I'd go to basic, and I'd have my, my Christian hat on, and I would be engaging with people in all of these things. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with it, because everything was well on the outside. And so many of us, I feel like, will stop following Jesus at this point, and have that religion mindset of all I have to do is follow Jesus when I'm around Jesus' people. Right? We'll settle for religion, which is this idea of performance-based faith that strives to earn love. Religion will judge you on what you're doing and what you're not doing. Religion will give you check boxes that says you're good enough, or maybe you're better than that person. Religion comes in and it gives you the idea that only what people see is what matters. But Jesus didn't die on the cross so you could get a checklist. He didn't die on the cross so you could come to church and he didn't die on the cross just to make your life better. Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins and to give you worth. He died on the cross so you could be a new creation. So you could become a disciple and follow Jesus. He did it so you could be in a relationship with him free from the do's and the don'ts, free from the rules. So this morning, church, I want to talk to you guys about following Jesus, relationship 
versus religion. I've got such an incredible heart for discipleship, not just in college students, but here in this church, in seeing men and women walk in the fullness that Christ has called you to be. We've got to follow Jesus. And so I want to give you four elements on following Jesus that if you apply them in your life will forever change the way you live. Are you guys ready? All right. So this morning, step one, following Jesus gives you identity. It gives you identity. If you've got your Bibles, it'll be on the screen as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things, all habits, all ideas, all temptations, everything you failed at, you've become new. And it took me into my second semester to realize that my identity can't be removed as I pleased. Because Jesus didn't die on the cross so I could choose when it was convenient to live for him. He didn't die on the cross so I could choose when it was convenient to put him on as an accessory. Church, he died so I could have new life. So I could live with him. And we're called the bride of Christ because we're supposed to be in relationship with him. Do you understand that when you're in relationship with him, now it doesn't matter when I put on my church hat, my identity is in Christ. And then I would go to the rugby team. My identity was no longer a rugby player. It was a Christian. And so I interacted and engaged in Christian ways. And then I would go with my engineering friends, and it didn't matter who I was around because my identity was in relationship with Jesus. There was so much freedom because I was married to Jesus. And so my identity through relationship was the same regardless of my surroundings. Imagine being married and only living married when your spouse was with you. Probably not a good marriage, right? Is she around? Yes, I'm married, right? And then you go out. But how many of us will come to church and this is the most Christ-like we'll act? This is the closest that we're going to be to Jesus any day of the week. When we realize if we're married to Jesus, it doesn't matter if I'm in church or out and about. My identity has to be the same. And I'll never forget the Holy Spirit started speaking to me when I realized that my identity had to be rooted in Christ everywhere that I was. Not just at basic, not just at church, but in the classrooms, late night study sessions, going out playing on the rugby field. My identity had to be rooted in him because he lives in me. Even if I'm not around my wife, I'm still married. And if I'm not in church, I'm still married to Jesus. We have to grab a hold of this. I missed it so, so much because to me, Jesus was an accessory. Where I was going, what I was doing, it was kind of like, is this going to be fashionable? Is this going to look good where I'm at? Right? Is Jesus going to want to participate with where I'm going? But Jesus isn't an accessory. And the last time I checked, Jesus didn't avoid being around people that were worldly and sinful. But he also never compromised his identity. He never compromised how he lived. He never um, allowed them to live their lifestyles. He was rooted in who he was. And there is a blessing when we get rooted in our identity in Christ. When we realize that nothing will shake me, wherever I go, he is with me, and we walk in that identity. We've got to realize that there's not checking boxes of good enough. I am a Christian. I'm not a good enough Christian. I'm not a bad Christian. I am a Christian. And that identity will carry me everywhere. So church, how many hats have you been wearing? How many identities do you cycle through? And how exhausting and tiring is it? It was exhausting for me. But following Jesus gives me identity. 
But second, following Jesus requires love. When we follow Jesus, we get this new identity, right? It's forever with us. And it permeates the very way we live and how we interact with the world around us. But religion will constantly come in and start giving you rules to live by. Right? A list of do's and don'ts. Maybe some of you are like me and you love knowing what's allowed and what's not allowed. Right? Like you want to see that fine line where you can walk because you want to know how close you can get to it. One of the things that I'm known for saying, and you can ask my wife, is... uh, well, there's not a sign that says you can't, right? Our first year of marriage, we went to Toronto, and we were in this hotel, and they had a beautiful pool on the first floor, and we're walking down the hallway on the second floor, and I don't know why they did this, but the hallway went right over the deep end of the pool. So I start sizing up, pool's 10 feet deep, the railing's jumpable, I'm, I'm scoping it out, and I can just see my wife staring at me. And she says, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And this is why God said it's not good for man to be alone, because I said, (laughs) I could totally jump this railing into the pool. And she looked at me and said, are you out of your mind? You can't do that. To which I responded, well, there's no sign, (laughs) right? This is allowed. And uh, for those of you that know, my wife won that out, and so I asked the lifeguard, shouted down there, and I said, is it okay if I jump? And he said, it'll be okay if we kick you out of the hotel. (laughs) I said, okay, I, I won't do that. Right? We're drawn to boundaries of knowing what is, what is acceptable, what is permissible, what is allowed. And so we love to have that, and that's what religion does. When we have an identity in Christ, religion creeps in and says, now what do you need to do? What do you no longer need to do? Right? Checklists and boundaries, we're always going to be looking for it to see where we stand. And I started doing this in my life. I like to call uh, sin management is what I'd started doing. I created these rules and these accountabilities and these roadblocks to manage the sin in my life. And the scary thing is, it it started working. Right? I, I would no longer do certain things, but then I would feel terrible on the inside because weeks and months would go by and then I would have binges of sin and my thoughts would go places so then I'd rebuild the roadblocks and I'd, I'd rewrite the list of rules to not do. All of a sudden, my prayers became based on outside compliance. Maybe you can relate to this. Lord, help me to not view porn. Lord, help me to not look at women this way. Help me to not steal and swear. Lord, help me to read my Bible. Help me to be more consistent at church. How many of us pray these prayers over and over because we know there are things in our lives we need to stop doing and there are things in our lives that we need to be doing more of and then we feel terrible. We say, God, why am I not doing it? Is there a better list of rules for me to follow? But this isn't new. In Matthew 22, 35 to 40, we read, One of them, a lawyer, comes to Jesus and asks him, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. I love, pun intended, I love Jesus' response. This young lawyer comes, like all of us, and says, what is the one thing that I must follow? Right? We are driven to have rules and boundaries. Jesus, what is the greatest law that I can follow? And I bet he was asking not just to know what to do, but two things. He said, what is the least that I can do so I do no less, but also I don't want to do any more than what's required? Right When we start putting rules and laws in our lives, that is the lens we look at things through. And Jesus responds and says, the greatest thing you can do is love. In your new identity as a Christian, rooted in Christ, the greatest thing you can do is not try to follow laws, but to live in love. Right? 
the best thing we can do is walk in that love. Because Jesus doesn't want sin management. He wants surrender. Let me say that again. Jesus doesn't want sin management. He wants surrender. And the surrender comes when we walk in love. First, loving God. Loving Jesus gives us that identity and enables us through a surrendered life to love people. So many times, right, we can still get caught up, and I, and I was. I had my identity in Christ. I was starting to walk in love, and again, religion would come in. That people pleaser inside of me would start to put rules and laws of how do I love God? How do I love people? Right? So I was still trying to please my pastors and I was still trying to please my rugby friends and I was still trying to, to please my classmates and high school friends and everyone around me. I was trying to please in my own ways. And it was exhausting. Until the Holy Spirit continued speaking and saying, will you live for me, identity, everywhere, around everyone? Would you be a new creation who lives by my spirit and not your flesh. Listen, church, when we live in the flesh, it breeds religion. But when we live by his spirit, it breeds love. When we live in the flesh, it breeds religion. And when we live in the spirit, it breeds love. I finally had identity in Christ and I was starting to walk in love, but my old self continued to get in the way. It continued to set up rules and laws and please this person, please that person, But following Jesus gives us identity. We have to walk in love. And thirdly, following Jesus gives us new life. Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So clearly, I remember uh, one night reading this verse and, and praying about it, and the Lord just giving me this vision of me being nailed to the cross and the crown of thorns wrapping around my body like barbed wire, and all of a sudden, his spirit coming out of me, leading me, leaving my flesh and my body dead on the cross so I could be alive in Christ. This picture forever changed how I related with Jesus how I walked in my identity. I recognized I need new life because my old life gets in the way. And Jesus comes and he wants us to walk in that. Right, all of a sudden my actions and my devotions became a byproduct of believing in Jesus, of loving Jesus, of walking with Jesus. I was excited to know him more, but yet religion was constantly coming into this new life wasn't always winning now, but it continued to come in and try to add rules and regulations and boundaries. It started screaming on my thoughts, you're walking with Jesus now. Don't mess up. Be perfect. Don't do that. Be perfect. You're not good enough. Right? Religion trying to beat down the walk and relationship I was in with Jesus. Live righteous. Do, do, do. Don't do this. Religion beating me down. But Jesus never demanded for us to be perfect. Instead, he perfects us by his love. Church, I want you to hear that. Jesus never demanded us to be perfect. We try to walk around and we say, when my life is together, I'll come to church. Right? We try to put on this perfection and to walk in it, but Jesus never asked it. He said, let my love perfect you. You can't do it on your own. That's why I want to talk about, see, when we follow Jesus, we get identity. It requires love, his love, and how we interact. And it gives us new life. But lastly, following Jesus is a relationship. It is not religion or rules. 
This is the most important part. Because as we follow Jesus, we are continually, every step of the way, wanting to conform to a checklist. Wanting to conform to, to do I do this, do I not do this. And all Jesus wants for his bride is to be in a relationship with him. I want to look at a few verses where Jesus is speaking. In John 14, verse 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We, we go further down to John 14, 21 to 24. And Jesus says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas then said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, he said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And he will come to him and, and we will make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. Many of us, myself included, we heard that. We read that, and what we hear is perform, or you don't love me. Be perfect, or you don't love me. We read this, and we look at our lives, and we say, I haven't done it. God, your word is so demanding, it's so heavy, I'm not living up to it. Therefore, you don't love me. And we beat ourselves up, and, and church doesn't become a celebration, it's kind of a dread. Or we look around, and we either feel holier than other people or way less holy because we're not doing it. We're not living in it. Right? Our minds race to a conditional works-based relationship, which is religion, one where high performance is rewarded with affection and love. If you live well, God is with you. If you mess up, you're doing something wrong. You haven't grasped it. As I was studying these things, I love what John Piper writes about it. John Piper says, The first thing to notice is that loving Jesus is not the same as keeping his commandments. It precedes and gives rise to the keeping of the commandments. John Piper says, Keeping his word is the result of loving him, not the same as loving him. We need to grab a hold of this. We've attacked following Jesus completely backwards, trying to, to, to get all the outside aligned while the inside rots. In light of what John Piper says, let's reread verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, the result will be that you will keep my commandments. Does anyone feel a little more relieved? Verse 23, If anyone loves me, the result will be will be that he will keep my words. What a sigh of relief. I can do that. Jesus, I can love you. I can pursue you. What's interesting is if we take that same lens and read verse 24, whoever does not love me, the result will be that he does not keep my words. All of a sudden, the checklists and the do's and the don'ts become aligned with the, with the relationship we have with Jesus? Have I been trying to earn it? Or can I just walk in it? Can I just pursue him? John Piper continues to elaborate. He says, what is this love for Jesus that gives rise to keeping the commandments of Jesus? Jesus has no defects. He has no demerit. Therefore, we cannot and dare not love him graciously the way God loves us. We dare not love him with a love that overcomes some fault or ugliness or sin in Jesus to treat him well. No, love for Jesus is entirely deserved. He is infinitely worthy of being loved. He is perfectly lovely. He is loved not in spite of what he is, but because of all that he is. I want to read that last part. Jesus 
Love for Jesus is entirely deserved. He is infinitely worthy of being loved. He is perfectly lovely. He has loved not in spite of what he is, but because of all that he is. You see, when God loves us, there's forgiveness and there's grace and all of these things come because we are broken, messed up people. But when we love Jesus, it is so deserved because he is so perfect. He is so selfless. He is so caring. You see, living in freedom is a result of love and surrender to Jesus. But most of us as Christians will try to earn and and have the checklist to live in freedom, and we fail every single day. And we wonder, why am I going to church? Why am I reading my Bible? Nothing is changing. My marriage is stressed. I'm yelling at my kids. I can't beat this drinking problem or this porn addiction, right? And we say, why is nothing happening? Why am I not walking in freedom? So we keep stacking the blocks of religion and the do's and the don'ts instead of walking in relationship with Jesus. It's amazing if we look in Jesus' ministry, you know, he ministered for three years where he made disciples, he preached the kingdom. In those three years of ministry, Jesus gave 410 commandments or imperatives, right? Go get the donkey, go find a place to stay, go and sin no more. In his first two years of marriage, do you know how many commandments and imperatives he gave? Two. Two thirds of Jesus' ministry in making disciples were founded on two commandments. Jesus said, Repent and follow me. That was it. Repent and follow me. As a disciple and a follower of Jesus, it's seeing who Jesus is and it's knowing who Jesus is that results in freedom. It results in repentance. It results in identity. It results in walking in love. It results in new life. We need to stop with sin management and just surrender. It's amazing. If we follow Jesus, that's what sets us free. Not the rules, not the boundaries, following Jesus. Because if we strive to live free out of our works, we'll struggle to get there. What's scary is you might accomplish outward actions that look great. But Jesus doesn't want sin management, right? He wants a new heart. He wants to change you from the inside so it produces the results. You don't have to get the results to earn his love. We've got to start living a life in love with Jesus. Church, we're not called to say a prayer. We're not called to even come to church. We are called to be and to make disciples. We are called to have an identity in Christ, to walk in love and new life that honors and represents him. But more importantly, church, we are not called to follow Jesus based in religion and rules. We are called his bride because he wants a relationship with us. As the band comes up, I shared earlier about my sin management and the approach that I had based in religion. And again, sadly, it worked. I viewed porn less. I swore less. I was in my Bible more. I came to church more. But the inside of me was rotting until I surrendered and walked in identity and love where Jesus started filling all of that. You see, Jesus wants to renew our hearts and not just our actions. The freedom I walked in wasn't because of the boundaries I set. It's because I walked in love with Jesus. I loved Jesus more than porn, and so I got victory. I loved Jesus more than language and and filthy uh, swearing. I got freedom in that. The love for Jesus made everything that gripped my heart pale in comparison, and it no longer held me. So church, where is your focus? If I said, don't think about a pink elephant, don't do it, right? How many of you are thinking about a pink elephant? So many of us do this with our sin every day. We say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. 
And then we do it and we go, why did I miss it? I walked in freedom because I loved Jesus. I thought about Jesus. And you can walk in freedom too when you love Jesus more than your blank. Whatever your blank is, love Jesus more than it. You'll see it slip away. Imagine a marriage where every day you woke up and said, don't cheat on my spouse, don't cheat on my spouse, don't cheat on my spouse. (laughs) Does anyone want to live in a marriage like that? Would it be productive and fruitful? But now imagine a marriage where you wake up and you say, I love my spouse. I'm so thankful for my spouse. I praise my spouse. I bless my spouse. Does anyone see the difference of that kind of relationship? Right? When I think and dwell on the love of that relationship, it's going to produce actions. It's going to produce the way we live. We need to approach Jesus in the same lens of a marriage relationship. We need to recognize that the more I receive and return love to Jesus, the less the world and the things I struggle with will grip me. So church, I want to challenge you this morning to be a church of disciples, to spend time with Jesus and to allow his love to conquer all areas, to follow Jesus and get your identity, to walk in love and new life and in a relationship. So I just want to pray this morning. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for those viewing online. And I pray that you would just reveal to us identity in you. Love and new life and relationship. Father, that marriages would be transformed, that the way we raise our children would be changed, that our work ethic, that our anger or drinking or porn addictions, identity issues would all go away. Not because of our trying and our doing, but because of our love and relationship with you. Father, I thank you for this church, and I pray right now that you would break the bonds of religion and give us the lens of relationship to see you. Amen.